I am so excited to be here. I hope by sharing three stories with you about what Bentley students have been up to over the last couple of years that you'll share some of this hope and enthusiasm too and understand why this is so rewarding. Um, when I think about how my generation has screwed everything up to a fairly well, um, nothing gives me greater hope than this particular group of kids who are coming of age right now. So I am nobody's version of a traditional college president. And I got to the Bentley presidency by a highly unorthodox set of um, positions and jobs as, as in the legal world. Um, I worked in Washington, DC. Um, I've worked in the corporate world. I've worked in government. I've worked in the NGO world. And finally, through serendipitous pathways that I won't have time to describe today, I've found my way to Bentley. But I was trained as a lawyer, went to UVA and Vassar as an undergrad in UVA Law School. And trained as a lawyer means that you're trained to solve problems. But my real interest in problem solving started at a much earlier age, as you can see on the big screen. I read my first mystery novel, The Secret of the Old Clock, when I was seven years old. And I knew that very moment I wanted to be Nancy Drew. Nancy Drew was, if some of you can recall, she was a thinker and a doer. She managed to solve world problems in a snap, um, in her community and beyond her community, and she did it all impeccably dressed in matching skirt and heels. <laughs> I knew, I knew that I should grow up to be Nancy Drew. So following um, this very long and peripatetic career in government and law, um, a few years ago, five years ago, I finished Thomas Friedman's The World is Flat. And it made such an impact on me. I just couldn't put the thing down. I kept going back, and I was thumbing through. And my law firm, Foley Hoeg, sent me down to UVA Law School to interview law students to come to, to Foley. And I remember meeting with these law students and having one of those aha moments. They were scary smart. They had all the technical skill sets you would imagine that good young lawyers should have. But to a one, they told me they wanted to make a difference in the world. And just a couple of months after that, again, thumbing through Thomas Friedman's The World is Flat, I found this line in the book. As the world is being flattened more than anything else, it's this generation that's going to need the right imagination and the right motivation to succeed. Well, those law students had shown the right imagination and the right motivation to succeed. And I thought then, gosh, this is the group I want to work with somehow, some way. So imagine my shock when literally out of the blue, several months later, I was contacted by Bentley in a search for a new college president. And although it seemed like the most unorthodox of pathways, I knew at that very moment that this was exactly the right next thing for me to do. So today, I'm four and a half years into my presidency. They have not voted me off the island yet. Um, all good so far. Um, I find these students just amazing. They're so compelling. Obviously, they know how to produce a bottom line set of results. They know how to read balance sheets. But at the same time, they're just as much about people and planet as they are about the things they're learning that will make them good business people, too. I tease these students that they come to Bentley. How many in this audience knew when you were 17 or 18 years old what you wanted to do with your life. I was a 30-year-old right out of law school lawyer saying, shouldn't I go do something to graduate school and something else? Um, how these kids know, I don't know. But they come to Bentley really incredibly and usually highly focused. And they know both that they want to do something broadly in the business world or take their passion with business skills to do something else. Um, but I tease them that they're right out of a Disney movie or a, an up with people um, singing troupe. Because in addition to being clever, in addition to being smart, in addition to having those business skill sets and wanting to develop them, they're just uncharacteristically for this generation always upbeat and enthusiastic. And I 
think it's because they do have a sense of where they're going, and they know that the pathway should lead them both to being great folks in the corporate world, but that they should incorporate this larger sense of the world. This is the very set of right and left brain characteristics um, that Daniel Pink wrote about in his book, A Whole New Mind, one of my favorite books if you haven't read it yet. He talks, of course, about the left brain characteristics that we're all familiar with, especially coming out of the information age, quantitative, analytical capabilities. Those are great things to have, but more and more in an innovation economy, you need to have those right brain characteristics too. That means inventiveness, empathy, understanding the point of meaning in your work, and joyfulness. And perhaps this is exactly the sort of pivotal time in our world where both from an education perspective and more broadly, we're finally getting this conjoined capability between the left and right brains. So drawing this closer connection between a business education and the humanities is not simply what Bentley's all about. We completely integrate arts and sciences in a business curriculum, and we have for a number of years. Well, I'm grateful to say that most other business schools literally across the world are doing this too, because they get this left-right brain need. Our business dean, that would be Chip Wiggins, on your, on my left, and that would be Dan Everett on the right, our liberal arts dean. They act in, in tandem on virtually everything they do. Dan calls it fusion, this full integration of liberal arts and business in a business school context. So when I think about these kids, here's what I see every day. I see the next generation of change agents. These are the kids who get, we're gonna produce the right set of profits and bottom line, but we get the part about people and profits too. So with that, I now wanna to turn to three stories that I wanna share with you about things that are happening at Bentley. The first story is what we're doing with the renowned service organization City Year. Bentley's the first school in the country, the first college or university, to have a full-scale city year program. It was born of a conversation that Michael Brown and I had at a lunchroom table three years ago, and we decided then and there, why don't we do this? Bentley's put a million dollars into scholarships to send up to 10 great students who are not only qualified to go and do something real in schools and inner cities across the country, but also the kinds of kids who want and know that they're gonna make that kind of a difference in kids' lives. So we we put a million dollars into scholarships. At this point, we've sent kids to nine cities across the US over the last three years. This year, we're getting ready to send um, probably a full complement of 10 kids um, going into next year's program. And I'm absolutely thrilled to say that there are now 29 other colleges and universities across the country, including some locally like BU, BC, and Brandeis, who've also <laughs> taken up the charge and now have city year programs. So here's what, to me, is so special about about this. These Bentley students, whether they're in Bentley as undergrads or as grad students, are spending a full gap year in inner city, tough neighborhoods, helping students learn better, stay in school, and figure out what they might want to do with their lives. I want to tell you a little bit about one of our city year um, uh, students, Kiernan Paterno. She graduated from Bentley in 2010. She spent all of last year in Seattle, Washington, working in the public schools there, and came back to Bentley this year to get her MBA. Here's what she says. She says that moving across country gave her an amazing new sense of independence. She knew no one in Seattle. But what was really impactful was to work on a team, a team that was drawn from hither and yon, and some kids had been to college and some hadn't. But she found that coming through an experience like that taught her a great deal about patience and understanding and flexibility. And she can take that team orientation to everything she's going to do. But what really made a difference in her life was the kids she worked with. These these were elementary school kids who came from very difficult backgrounds. And it sort of, the, their experiences and how they behaved as a result ran at odds with what she would have expected. Here's a quote from Kiernan. The joy I saw in their faces during the school day amazed me. No matter how many life challenges these kids faced, they continued to live their lives every single day with joy. They lived in the moment. It's a lesson I'll carry with me always. So we're lucky she's back getting her MBA and she's now our city year marketing coordinator, which means she's the one who's selling the program to the next group of kids who are gonna go to city year. And here's what she wants, here's her goal. She believes that some Bentley students believe they're giving a gap year before they go off into the corporate world, that it's somehow their last chance to do something huge and meaningful before they head off to their, to their business careers. Instead, she wants to convince them that now 
Service is a lifelong aspiration and avocation, and it has to be fully integrated into your busy lives and careers. So our next project that I want to talk to you about briefly is our Ghana project. We're extraordinarily proud of what we do in Ghana because it began several years ago as a short-term study abroad project like many schools have in many places. Um, but what's happened since is it's turned into a multifaceted, university-wide program where we are sending students and faculty on a real-time, all-the-time basis um, throughout the school year. And what we've done in, sit in uh, Ghana is we first worked in a school there called Mofratram. It's a group that we've gotten to be very close to and we're very proud because of our work with Mofratram and the school children who live there um, and are trained um, to given an education, healthcare, and given the opportunity for jobs. Because of what we've been able to do, Mofratram now has a number of self-sustaining business enterprises and they no longer have to seek Western donations. So countrywide, what we've done is we've expanded to a million other, not a million, to many other NGOs um, located in Ghana. We're in Accra. We're working in a number of villages across the country. And I'm incredibly excited because next summer I get to go um, and meet with the NGOs. And I'm taking Jackie Jenkins Scott, for those of you who may know her, who's the president of Wheelock. And I'm positive we're going to be transformed by the experience. But let me just mention one example of what we've done there. Two students, Mark DiMaggio and Sam Etter, spent the better part of last summer working with a company called Biofill, one of the NGOs. Biofill provides clean, safe toilet facilities in schools, in hospitals, and in other organizations in a country that obviously um, you would find these few and far between. The great thing about biofill and this toilet system is that you don't need an elaborate sewer system. You don't need infrastructure. What you need instead are renewable resources of air and rainwater. So they've traveled to public schools across Ghana and talked about the needs and did a, a plan for putting these biofill toilet systems in each of the schools that they visited. But the part that was so compelling to me, and I got a chance to hear them present a few weeks ago, was that when they returned, they said what every other student who's been to Ghana and every faculty member has said, their lives were changed in ways they could not have imagined. What they found was they were so stretched beyond their comfort zones, both in terms of living there and in terms of their work, um, that they will be ever, forever changed by that. So my third and last story really relates to how important service learning is, not just at Bentley, but at colleges literally across the country now, and I'm so glad it is. It's a movement that started back in the 1980s, and now service learning, both for course credit and not, is something that you will find at most colleges and universities. At Bentley, we're particularly proud of it, but I think for us as a business university, this is such a critical part of our return on investment. Students and their families pay a huge amount of money to come to a private university like Bentley. And while I know we give them the skill sets to go and get great jobs in the real world when they leave and our statistics are phenomenal, that's not the point. Service learning, so fully integrated at Bentley, gives them the opportunity to understand that corporate social responsibility, that social responsibility more broadly, just must be a meaningful part of their lives. To me, that's a real ROI. So I now want to introduce you to one of my favorite people in the world. I know I'm not supposed to say this. I have 4,000 undergraduates and 1,500 grad students at Bentley. But this student is nothing short of remarkable. Um, I want to tell you about Sarah Benson and our anti-bullying project at Bentley. It's called One Goal, One Community. And it's something that Sarah initiated. She graduated from Bentley last May with a major in marketing. And she's back getting her MBA. Bentley kids don't leave Bentley, as you can see. But she's, um, a, she grew up in Middletown, Rhode Island. She has three sisters, but she grew up with a disabled cousin and saw and experienced the bullying that occurs in public schools and other places firsthand. Because of that, she and a team of Bentley faculty and students are now literally on the front line with the anti-bullying movement, both here in the US um, and abroad. What's interesting is that in her work at Bentley with Professor Greg Hall, they have taken and pulled together a program that is student-led in elementary, junior high, and high schools and galvanizes through rallies and teams entire groups of students to understand the impacts of bullying. But what's more interesting to me is that this program was actually created um, half a world away. So I'm going to ask 
Sarah to come on stage because it's really her story and she can tell it so much better than I can. So Sarah, tell me what inspired you to do this work. Um, well, as you mentioned, I'm extremely close with my cousin Kelsey who has a disability. And growing up, Kelsey would share stories about how mean the kids were to her as a target for bullying. So I had always wished that someone was there to advocate for her and stand up for her. So I have this passion now for not only working with people with disabilities, but also advocating for the targets of bullying. Uh, so in the spring of 2010, I headed down to Australia for a semester at Bond University. And when I was there, I was working with Dr. Amy Kenworthy. Um, together we worked on implementing a service learning component into her business negotiation course. So the project actually began when 12 Bond University students teamed up with a local high school working with 300 10th graders on an anti-bullying program for their school. Uh, actually we had so much buy-in from the school and the community that we were able to inspire over 10,000 community members to sign a pledge against bullying and stand up by wearing a wristband that I actually have on my wrist. Um, and it was just incredible getting the numbers together. So how did you bring One Goal, One Community back to Bentley and the greater Boston area? Uh, when I returned, Professor Greg Hall at Bentley was actually doing research for his cyber psychology course on the impacts of information technology and social media in particular on human behavior and bullying. So we took the One Goal, One Community model that I developed in Australia and paired it with his cyber psych class and kicked off the program in Milton, Massachusetts in the fall of 2010, uh, where we held a workshop for parents on the topic of cyberbullying. And then the next day, we um, held a series of rallies for 4,000 kids in the Milton school system, grades K through 12, really empowering them to stand up against bullying. So um, with that movement, we had um, a lot of inspiration from the Bentley students uh, who wanted to continue this, and we were able to implement many other programs in the greater Boston area in schools um, under Mayor Menino's request. Where would you see the Bentley program going now? What happens over the next couple of years? Um, well, actually, the Bentley program was able to gain such momentum through the support of the Bentley Service Learning Center. Service Learning offers students the opportunity to get an additional course credit for extensive training in the area of bullying and um, participation in these programs. So. Without that, we wouldn't have such committed students working and continuing to develop programs as sustainable ones. And Sarah, I have to ask you one last question. Where do you see your career and your commitment to civic engagement going? This program has actually changed my life in many incredible ways, uh, both personally and professionally. And I'm currently in grad school at Bentley, going for my MBA. And it, it ha has occurred to me that the importance of building sustainable programs in our communities is just so um, important. So it would be my dream in the future to establish my own nonprofit organization empowering people towards positive change in our communities. Sarah is why I came to Bentley. Thank, <laughs> Thank you, you, Sarah. <laughs> Let me just end by sort of coming back full circle, back to my friend Thomas Friedman. Um, these kids, this to me is the new definition of a business education in the U.S. and hopefully writ large across the world. I hope it's the same at the MBA level. Uh, but we are all on a remarkable pathway now, and I think it's exactly the right moment to get this convergence right. So here's what Thomas Friedman ends with. He had a charge in The World is Flat for this incredibly talented millennial generation. Here's what he says. While your lives have been powerfully shaped by 9-11, the world needs you to be the generation of strategic optimists, the generation with more dreams than memories, the generation that wakes up each morning and not only imagines that things can be better, but also acts on that imagination every day. My charge to myself every day is to figure out the best way to educate these students through skill sets that can be deployed to make the world a better place, creativity, and that strong moral compass that all generations need. But this one, charged with fixing global challenges, will need more than ever. So I have a charge for you guys, too. 
which is um, this is such a generation of thinkers and doers. My hope is that everyone in this room will figure out a way to be directly engaged with the millennial um, generation. Please think of ways that you can engage, because what I see in this generation is that they will be really terrific when they go out into the organizational world, but they will be the ones to tackle and finally resolve the social and economic challenges. So thank you all so much for letting me do this. It's a dream come true to be with all of you.